Thanks very much, Doug. And uh, thanks to you all for coming out here today. How are you feeling? You all oriented? <laughs> are you feeling like a, like a perfect concentric circle, right? You're just so perfectly oriented now? Yeah? Well, we'll see. Well, hopefully I won't damage that too much. Um, <coughs> so as Doug said, the, the title of my talk today is Shelter Stories. And it's about the work that I've done uh, around issues of, of literacy and storytelling and writing of various sorts um, in homeless shelters here in town. I want to begin this talk by telling you a little bit about this picture. I'm going to tell you the story of this photograph, which is a, a photograph that I took myself. Um, as, as Doug mentioned, I, I teach writing. And one of the, the forms of writing and the forms of storytelling that I'm most interested in are visual kinds. So not just the kinds we, we make with words as such, but the kinds that we can make with photographs. And so um, I take a lot of photographs around town. And often what I'll do is, having taken the photograph, it'll occur to me um, some way to kind of recontextualize that photograph with words. Right? And that the, the, the photographs that I tend to like the most are the ones that inspire some kind of title in my head that makes me see the image in the photograph a little bit differently. So I'm going to tell you the story of how this photograph came into being. Okay. So this was taken about a year and a half ago. I think it was two winters ago that I took this photograph. It's, uh, as you can see, this is a... Um, shopping cart full of somebody's earthly possessions. And this is in an alleyway, sort of around the corner from my house. And it was very, very cold at the time that, that I took this photo. And I noticed I live in the, the Capitol Hill neighborhood, a bit north of here. And when I leave my house and I go and I catch the bus around the corner, I sort of pass by this alleyway. And I noticed that this cart was sitting out there. And it was really freezing cold. And there was much more snow on the ground when I first saw it. It had been like three days of 20-something degree weather. And it struck me that, that that can't be good. Right? That if a shopping cart full of somebody's possessions is you know, in the, uh, out in the cold and in the snow like that, and there's nobody there with it, there's probably not a very happy story attached to that. Um, and I noticed it again the next day. I noticed it again the day after that. It was really starting to eat away at me, you know, what had happened. And I remembered at a certain point that I had heard you know, a couple nights earlier I had heard lots of uh, sirens, there were ambulances, there were police cars in this alleyway, which again is sort of just a half block away from my house, um, more, than, more than usual. You know, it's clearly something had happened. But I didn't go out and investigate, partly because it was just so damn cold. Right? And I put two and two together, and I realized that the ambulances must have been there for whoever left these, these belongings behind. Okay? And I went, as I was coming home from, from campus one day, and I took a photograph more, mostly out of a kind of obscure desire to memorialize this event somehow, even if it was only just for me. I felt that somehow it should be memorialized because what could be sadder, what could be more tragic than a person who perhaps died you know, of hypothermia on that cold night and there's their last will and testament, or perhaps got <laughs> very, very sick and was taken away to a hospital, and you don't know anybody who can go and get your stuff. So when you get out, you don't have what amounts to all of your stuff anymore. And so I was moved to just take a, a photograph of it. So I did. And when I was looking at the photograph, when I got home, I came up with this title. Okay. Second Kings 211, or Transfiguration and Gentrification. Anybody here remember where Second Kings 211 comes from? Very good. Do you remember what story? Pardon? Oh, okay. Well, if you didn't read it, probably not. Anybody here remember? For this, one of the more famous ones. It's, this, uh, it's a line. I'll put it up here. It comes from uh, uh, the story of the prophet Elijah. Okay. I'm actually going to have to move over here. I realize I didn't print out this quote. I'll read it to you, though. So, and it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven." Okay. So this is one of the more dramatic and better known uh, passages from what they call the Old Testament. And it involves the prophet Elijah, who's known to be kind of the holiest, the purest, the most almost godly sort of figure in his community, so holy and so pure that he seems to be almost too good for this world. And one day, as he's walking along with his pal and disciple, um, a, what they call a chariot of heaven or a chariot of fire sort of sweeps down from the skies 
sucks them up, right? It's so fast, right? It spirits them away to heaven so fast that it actually sucks them out of his clothes. Right? His mantle falls to the ground as he's taken up to heaven. Okay? And I think the reason that this passage popped into my head as I was looking at the photograph is because it seems to me all of the sort of elements of that story are here in one form or another, right? So we've got, on the one hand, this beam of light that's like a tractor beam, right? It's right on this shopping cart here, but there's no person with the shopping cart anymore, right? Um, all that's left behind is their possessions, and you can see some of the clothing, right? As if somebody had been sucked up uh, by this tractor beam and uh, their mantle was the only thing left behind. At the same time, if you look at the wall here, the brick wall, you can see the uh, painting of an uh, automobile. This is the back of a, an auto body shop. And there's a painting of an automobile here, a literal chariot of fire, right? Insofar as automobiles run on internal combustion. So we've got that piece of the puzzle there as well. But also I think the, the, what made this story come to mind for me is that the, the version of the story, the, the biblical story that we get, is in many ways all about the kind of vast discrepancy between the material world right, and whatever is beyond the material world. That the, these are vastly different things. Right? Um, and so I gave it a title that refers back to those lines. But I also called it Transfiguration and Gentrification. And the reason for that is, on the one hand, what happened to Elijah is a form of transfiguration. Right? And one could say that by taking this photograph and by kind of framing it in the way that I did, that's a kind of a transfiguration too, and that that's part of what stories do, right? They take the most mundane, most material, most ordinary elements of everyday life, and they transform them, they make them meaningful by turning them into a story in some way. So one could say that that is what's happening here in the uh, photograph. At the same time, <coughs> you could say that what I'm doing, intentionally or not, is gentrifying this story. Right? Because it's not the person whose experience is represented here who's telling the story. It's me who's coming along and creating a story out of these elements. And again, if you live in a neighborhood like Capitol Hill in Denver or any of the other neighborhoods in Denver that were formerly working class neighborhoods or poorer neighborhoods that have since been turned into something else, something much more marketable, much more expensive, well, that's a way that in which the well-to-do impose their stories upon the poor, physically on the landscape, right? So I share this, this uh, image with you because I think it gets at one of the most um, important themes and what I want to discuss as we go forward. The idea of homelessness and the fact and the reality of homelessness, that the shopping cart full of a person's possessions is probably the most well-known kind of icon of homelessness that you can imagine, okay? But I also want to think about how it is that the stories of those kinds of experience are made and by whom and how that kind of implicates the people who are involved in the storytelling or uh, about whom the stories are told, how they become uh, implicated in sort of relationships of power. So, um, as Doug mentioned uh, a little while ago, so, <coughs> um, I came here about 10 years ago to Denver to teach in the university writing program, and almost immediately, a year, year and a half later, myself and Eliana Schoenberg, who was the director of the writing center at the time, and our friend Jeffrey Bateman, who teaches at Regis University now, um, we decided that we wanted to try to take the writing center, okay? The writing program offers classes, but we also have something called a writing center, where folks come in um, sort of of their own volition in order to work on whatever kinds of writing they work on. Can we take that form of uh, writing instruction out off campus into town um, and make the writing center available to a kind of a wider public? And eventually we settled on doing it at a pair of homeless shelters. The, I think there's both uh, still the, the two largest homeless shelters in downtown Denver. The St. Francis Center, which is in uh, the Five Points neighborhood and which I'll be talking about mostly, and another shelter called uh, The Gathering Place, uh, which is on Colfax Avenue. And we are, uh, came to these places in order to do there what we do on campus, which is hang out, wait for people to come to us with some kind of writing that they're working on, that they want to get some kind of feedback on, and we do our best to help them in whatever way seems to work best for them. In other words, as distinct from 
maybe a classroom where you've got a teacher in the front of the room who's structured a bunch of activities for you for that day, and you're kind of inserting yourself into those activities. Writing center work involves letting the writer kind of take charge of the time that you spend together. And as a teacher, you're trying to, to figure out how best to serve the writer in the way that they um, best want to be served. So what we found uh, as we spent some time in these two places <laughs> is that we got um, uh, a more kind of various uh, array of, of forms of writing than we thought we would ever get. In other words, we knew coming into a, a daytime shelter for the homeless you are likely to um, have writers who want to work on, for example, resumes, um, housing applications, right? All of the kinds of uh, uh, writing that one has to do in order to take care of very pragmatic, very kind of day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, we figured, or we knew, we were going to see folks like that. But what we also found is that at least half, sometimes more, of the folks who come to see us work on writing that has nothing to do in any direct way with what you might call practical day-to-day -day living. That people come in writing stories, writing poetry, writing screenplays, writing memoirs, writing sort of personal essays. Um, all of that stuff that we might lump together under creative writing or something like that. The folks came um, uh, and hang out with us in order to work on that writing too. Okay. Um, and this is where it takes place. It takes place in the case of the St. Francis Center out on the floor. That isn't the table that I actually sit at, but it might just as well be. You know, it's got a folding table. We go out into the floor, and there are sometimes as many as you know, 200, 300 people in the room at a given time. And amidst all of that noise and amidst all of that mayhem sometimes, um, we sit down together and we spend some time writing. Okay. And the St. Francis Center, the gathering place too, and the idea of a place where you can come and get not only out of the elements, out of the heat and out of the cold, but away from uh, all of the other dangers and all the other indignities that one faces when you're living on the streets. Uh, the idea of, of a house of hospitality, as they sometimes call it, has a, quite a long history, and it's a history that's very connected to the idea of writing as well. Anybody recognize this person? Yeah, I saw a hand. No? Yes. I'm sorry, I don't know names, but I do see a hand over here. Who is it? Dorothy Day. That's right, Dorothy Day. <laughs> Very good. Oh, because it's on there. Oh, silly me. <laughs> that was a quiz. <laughs> Only you passed, young man, who spoke her name. Uh, but does anybody know who Dorothy Day is? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. She, in fact, is on the path to sainthood right now. They're somewhere in the Vatican, they're wondering whether or not to name her Saint Dorothy. But Dorothy Day has a very, very interesting story herself, that she um, was, as a younger person, what they called a Greenwich Village Bohemian. She was a very kind of artsy person. She was a journalist for radical newspapers and so on. Um, and who, in the, I think it was 1929, 1928, 1929, experienced this kind of profound religious conversion right? and became a very devoted Catholic. Um, and if any of you grew up, as I did, in a Catholic family, you know that the words avant-garde and Catholicism, they're not usually words that you sort of put together, right? That Catholicism is all about tradition and hierarchy and authority and so on, at least in the popular conception of it. And yet here was this person who was a kind of crazy Greenwich Village bohemian and an avant-garde artist and a radical left-wing um, journalist and forever getting arrested or protests and so on. And she converted to Catholicism in a really kind of deep way. Okay. And interestingly, did that without just sort of renouncing who she had been up until that moment. In other words, in her mind, those two things went hand in hand. Okay. That her religious convictions were radical and avant-garde. And so one manifestation of that um, let me see if I've got it. The first manifestation of that was in the form of this newspaper. It's called The Catholic Worker, so named as a way of contrasting it with the, um, uh, what do they call it? The Communist Worker, the, the Daily Worker, rather, which was the newspaper of the Communist Party. She felt that she wanted to get her message out, um, her sort of religious me message and her message of solidarity with the poor to get it out to the masses in the same way that um, communists and socialists were and so on. And so they started to distribute this newspaper called The Catholic Worker, 
only cost a penny a copy. If you want to subscribe to it now, you can. And it is, in fact, still only a penny a copy. They will send it to your house. So that's been like 80 years uh, that this uh, newspaper has been uh, published. So she and some of her friends started this Catholic worker newspaper. And the house in which they put this thing together became a hub of activity, um, grassroots activity. Other folks who were homeless or experiencing poverty, because this was at the height of the Great Depression, who um, uh, came around, you know, sort of hung around, as it were, just to be kind of part of what was going on around the Catholic, news, uh, Catholic worker newspaper. And so at a certain point, she decided, you know what? We should just throw open the doors. That we, it's, it's wrong, if we, if we really have the courage of our convictions, it's wrong to treat our home as private property. We're going to open it up so that anybody who wants to come and to be here can do so. And started the first of what they call the Catholic worker houses. And it was an idea that really kind of caught on. The, the, there are still two Catholic worker houses in New York City where the first one started out, but they've since grown. They're all over the country. Um, all over the world, in fact, you can go almost anywhere, you'll find a Catholic worker house somewhere. But they're not, this isn't an official kind of church activity. This is not like a Catholic charity, say. It's not a kind of a, the, the charitable wing of the church. It's a grassroots kind of social justice, anti-poverty movement that is completely autonomous. And each house is completely autonomous from the others. It's a very kind of radical, almost anarchistic kind of approach to social justice work where volunteers are so moved um, by their desire to, to do the right thing that they make uh, sort of voluntary vows of poverty. They'll go and live and work in the Catholic Worker House where other homeless and poor people are living and working in an effort to create a kind of true sense of community and to make common cause with people who are experiencing this, this social injustice. So that's a... Uh, like one of the Catholic worker houses in New York. In a little bit, I'm going to show you uh, there's a Catholic worker house here in Denver, too. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Okay. So anyway, that's the tradition that the St. Francis Center and the Gathering Place come out of. The idea of having a shelter where you can not only access certain kinds of um, services and so on, but a place where you can just be a human being amongst other human beings and share your condition and share your life experiences with one another. Um, that's what we were doing with the Community Writing Center. Um, now, as I said, <laughs> the, uh, the kinds of uh, material that come into us, the kinds, of, the kinds of writing and the kinds of stories that come into us are really various. Right? So in addition to resumes and, and all of this kind of thing, um, we've had a, one of the guests there at the center has since self-published a book uh, it's made up of largely academic essays of all things, right? You wouldn't think that anybody who was not forced to do it because they <laughs> work at a university, would feel the need necessarily. But he's in fact one of the most prolific um, writers and publishers that I, that I know and has written, written um, uh, sort of literary criticism and feminist theory um, and sort of sociological analysis and so on. Spent years working on this and eventually published it himself. Um, we've had people who've written sort of epic narrative poems, um, folks who have done um, really, you know, sort of profound and moving memoirs and so on and so forth. Um, so you get a, a variety of different kind of people and what, and different kinds of stories. And what we've come to appreciate, I think, or certainly what I've come to appreciate over my time doing it, is that how, how do, just how profound your commitment to writing has to be in order to find time during your day to, to work on a poem or to work on a piece of fiction when you are in a state of homelessness. Right? The, how much that must mean to you. Right? Think about it, when you don't know where uh, your bed is going to be that night, if you don't necessarily know where you're going to get food that day, you don't know if you're going to be able to get the medicine that you need to get, or if you are going to get it, it involves traveling halfway across town to do it. There is really no harder work, no busier work than being poor. And being truly poor is the hardest job in the world. To think that you're able to carve time out of that day, right, um, in order to sit down and write, writing has to really mean something profound to you, something really, really deep. And what I've come to think over the years of doing this kind of work is that access to literacy, the capacity to write and to see to it that your story is heard 
by someone other than just yourself and your maybe immediate circle of friends, but to get it out into the world, to be able to hear stories from, from other folks, to be able to sort of participate in the discourse of a community, that's a fundamental human need. Okay, just like food, just like water, just like shelter, that the, the ability to take part okay, in public discourse like that is a fundamental human need. And, I would argue, it ought to be a fundamental human right. So let me explain what I mean by that. I'm going to take a little detour into some scholarly stuff um, and see if I can connect it to what I've been discussing already. So this is a book called Citizens Without Shelter. It's by a guy named Leonard C. Feldman. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is to, to sort of um, extract the main argument of this book and to put it into dialogue with some other philosophers who've kind of thought about similar things and see if this helps to give us a kind of framework for thinking about the idea of literacy as a, as a fundamental human right. Okay. And to do that is going to require a little Greek. Aren't you happy? So the word that's up there, it's a zoan politikon. It's a Greek word. It means political animal. And it was um, not coined by, certainly most famously used by, a philosopher by the name of Aristotle, who I'm guessing that many of you have heard of. We've got a photograph up there. That is the Acropolis, and sort of what's left of ancient Greece, of the, the Greece of Aristotle's time, which would have, would have been about 2,500 years ago. Um, and what they would have called the polis, which was the, the Greek word for city, and which sometimes gets translated in English as city-state. In other words, it's sort of the basic unit of, of political life, the basic form of an autonomous kind of community. And according to Aristotle, who was trying to work out, among other, th other things, what is it that makes a human being a human being, um, but what makes a human community a human community, came to the conclusion that what defines human beings are that we are zoan politi politikon, we are political animals, okay? by which he means two things. First of all, we are animals, right, which we know. In other words, we're, we're not gods, we're not angels, we're living, breathing creatures with bodies and bodily needs and so on, but that what really makes us human is our participation in the polis, our participation in the city. That unlike other animals, dogs, cats, birds, whatever, they may herd together in one form or another, but they don't come together and speak. Right? They don't come together and communicate. They don't have a language. And by virtue of having a language, we, human beings, we're political animals, are able to make our world for ourselves. We're able to decide things. We're able to try to make things happen. We're able to remember a history and to project a future. And that that's what distinguishes us from the other animals. So says Aristotle, is the fact that we are animals who are made to live in a city. That distinction or that definition of humankind rests on a kind of an earlier distinction between two other uh, Two other ideas that Aristotle is drawing upon here. First of which is bios, they would say in Greek. We might say bios, and it's the root of the, the word for where we get words like biology, for example. But it, re it refers to life. It's a form of life, but life in its sort of natural state. Okay? Life as a, you know, as, as a body, you might say. There's that kind of life, but there's also zoe. And zoe is what Aristotle calls the good life, it's the life of the city the life of culture, the life of society, the life of human beings in dialogue and conversation with one another. So Aristotle's making a distinction between sort of mere life, as some call it, mere animal life on the one hand, and then cultural life, right? the life of the mind and the life of conversation. Human beings, according to Aristotle, belong to the second kind of life, fundamentally. That's what makes us us, even as we have some elements of us that are merely biological. So moving that forward a little bit and thinking about our friend Leonard Feldman and not just Aristotle, <coughs> we can see, or I'm going to try to show you, that there's a, a distinction there that actually bears upon our understanding of what poverty is. Okay? So typically when we hear the term poverty, what we think of, and Doug mentioned this earlier, is we think of various forms of physical privation. Right? We think of not having access to food, not having shelter, not having clothing, right? All of the kind of necessities of biological life we either don't have or we're at risk of losing. 
you talk about poverty, that's typically what people think about. Okay? But what I want to argue, and what I hope I can show you is, that there's an additional form of poverty, what I'm calling symbolic poverty. Symbolic poverty is the lack of access to what Aristotle would call zoe, right? the lack of access to a language or to a language that other people will hear and will listen to. Right? The inability to get your story out there, to get other people to listen to it, to have it recognized as an authentic story worthy of being heard. Right? And that these two things work hand in hand. So that when we're thinking about people who are experiencing poverty, it's not just because they, they lack this, that, or the other physical good. That part of what poverty means is that you don't have the capacity to then tell the story of what's, what that's like in a way that other people will understand and respond to and maybe take action on. Right? That other people do the talking for you. You're reduced to a statistic. You're reduced to... Uh, a form that's turned in in order to access services, right? You don't get to tell your own story. You exist as mere life, mere biological life. Somebody else has the power to tell the story that includes you or that maybe doesn't include you at all. Right? Or you're just excluded from it entirely. And Feldman's point is that that's no accident, that what we're seeing here is in its most intense form, sort of the way that power works in the society in which we live. That in order for the powerful to establish their power, to maintain their power, and to extend that power, they need to have people who serve as figures of mere biological life. Okay. That they're kind of oddly enough dependent on those figures to sustain their power. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stories that I've heard here at the St. Francis Center or been involved in telling that I think illustrate this point. And the first is, <coughs> this is almost a, a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Um, one day I'm sitting there at the St. Francis Center when a gentleman comes over to me, sort of brought over there by one of the folks who works at the center, and says that, I forget his name, let's call him Steve. Steve needs help filling out this form. He's got a, a, a form that he needs to fill out in order to get access to disability services. Um, he needs help filling out this form. He can't do it on his own. And Steve sits down, and I, and I notice that the reason that Steve can't fill it out, or so it seems to me, has less to do with, um, it wasn't the case that he couldn't read the form necessarily, or he couldn't find the words to fill the form in, but he was literally shaking. Right? His hands were just shaking at the thought of having to do this. Right? His hands were shaking, and he seemed physically ill at the thought of having to submit to filling out this form. So I said, well, that's fine. I'll, uh, you know, I'll fill it out for you. I'll, just, I'll ask you the questions, and you tell me what you want me to put down. And so we do, and we're going through it. And if any of you have ever experienced or seen the kinds of paperwork you have to fill out if you're applying for something like um, disability benefits, for example, they are astonishingly invasive. Right? That whoever is behind this form wants to know literally everything about you, and in particular, everything about you as a body, you as a physical life. And that, sort of, I surmised as we went on, was the real source of the anxiety that Steve was feeling. That filling out this form felt as if he was being dissected, as if he was being put on a table and taken apart with scalpels. Because the questions include things like, not just what is your name, what is your address, et cetera, and so forth, but um, are you sexually active? If you're sexually active, with whom do you tend to be sexually active? Men, women, or both? If you're sexually active, um, uh, do you use birth control? What kind of birth control do you use? Right? The kinds of questions you would never, ever ask somebody you just you know, met anonymously on the street. Steve was being forced to kind of open himself up that way um, to some anonymous figure of power somewhere in a bureaucracy. And in part because he had just come, uh, uh, Steve had spent, I think, 10 years in prison, had only gotten out a couple of days before he came in to see me, had similarly you know, spent a significant portion of his life under the complete bodily control, right, the complete physical regulation of the state. And so f uh, filling out this form, asking for disability benefits, felt like going back to prison again. It felt like submitting to the physical control of the state yet again. <coughs> 
So there's an example of somebody who is pre- sort of prevented from taking place, taking part of the, the life of the polis and being able to tell his story in the way that he wants to tell it, certainly at that, this moment, because somebody else is telling the story of his body and has been telling the story of his body for years and that their power is in some way contingent upon that. Let's see what's coming up next. So there's a kind of unhappy version of the sorts of stories that we, we become involved in at the Community Writing Center. I'll tell you a little bit about a, 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 more, a more gratifying, let's say, version of that. So in part because we had been hearing stories from folks for quite a few years and because the St. Francis Center was celebrating their 30th anniversary, we thought it would be a, a great idea to put together a book in which we collected stories by folks who worked there, who came there as, as guests, uh, who had been uh, associated with the place for a long time, sort of assemble all of these stories in one place. And one of the nice features about a book like this is it enables people to tell their stories in ways that kind of rewrite this, the typical stories of homelessness and poverty with which you may be familiar. Right? So that folks who are experiencing poverty <coughs> are often looked at in, let's say, one of two ways, broadly speaking, that either this is your fault, there's something wrong with you, there's, you know, you're, you're, uh, we're pronouncing moral judgment on you, um, or on the other hand, as a kind of an object of pity. Right? So as, either as an object of moral judgment or an object of pity. But when you read the stories that individual people tell about how they came to be at the point in life in which they are at, um, where they want to go from there, and so on and so forth, suddenly that, those kind of cliches and those kind of stereotypes fall apart. Right? And you see the extraordinary variety of life stories that sometimes you know, result in a trip to the St. Francis Center. Um, when you hear it in the words of the people who are telling it, for the most part. Although many of the stories that we wrote, the folks who were telling them, didn't necessarily feel like they were writers themselves, and so they would ask us to, they would tell us their story and, they, and we would uh, write them. <laughs> but there was one guy in particular whose name is Glenn, who had been coming to see us at the Community Writing Center for a couple of years at this point, and who was quite an accomplished and really wonderful writer who asked, can I write my story myself? So that's what I've got up on the screen here. This is the story that, that Glenn wrote, almost in his own hand, you might say, because if you notice, there's all different kinds of fonts here just on this one page. Well, everything that, that Glenn brought into us was similarly a story kind of told in fonts, among other things. There was a very heavy kind of visual element to his storytelling, <laughs> and it all meant something. These weren't just sort of random choices. It's part of the overall art of the story. And so he was quite an accomplished you know, verbal, but also an accomplished visual storyteller. And what I want to do for you, this story is a bit too long for us to read in its entirety now. What I want to do is to read to you the first little bit of it, and then the last little bit, and in between to point out some things that are happening here, um, to give you an example of how powerful it can be for a person who is typically excluded from the public sphere to be able to tell their own story. So we begin. Birth, the, the innocent, the prick of a needle, a must for the fetal, a life of omission, lean and meek, <coughs> uh, a body of malnutrition, gentle and weak, the FAS syndrome, innocence passed hand to hand, and on more than one occasion there is no relation. Let us participate, and a judge will adjudicate. Native boy, native boy, you're not here, you're not there. Fate has turned its back on you. Red clay of Oklahoma, do not cry. This is uh, not your fate. Unto thee which is not grown, all shall be known. A new heading, foster homes. A woman, a man, who say, they are my mother, they are my father. Do they not know? There is never another. The one you call father, the one you call mother. Native boy, native boy, you're not good enough. And then a new heading, Indian boarding schools. Emancipate, shh, patience. Native boy, native boy, dirty and torn, the stammer of speech. What you say does not matter. What a hospital, only after the joy of laughter. Leave this one, go to that one, there is always more. Be not the one to wash up on shore. School to school, duels and ghouls. I listen to my heart, the vacant haunts, the memory of vicious taunts. Native boy, native boy, native boy, you know not who you are. And then the story kind of continues in this way. And so what you may have noticed even already is this is a story that's told in multiple voices. What we're getting are little vignettes of Glenn's experience, which if I were to paraphrase, give you a less interesting version of his life story. 
uh, he was of Native American descent, uh, had been born into a, a, a situation that required or that pr prompted the state to put him into foster homes. He bounced between different foster homes, never felt at home wherever he was in, you know, in any family or in any school. Okay? And as we'll see, the rest of the story here kind of uh, continues to give us these vignettes. And so what we get is a, a kind of um, uh, what they call a Bildungsroman in the English department or the literature department of any language. In other words, he's telling a very artful version of his own life story in multiple voices too. The title of this piece is Autobiography of Thought. Right? So we're not just getting in the kind of uh, almost Times New Roman-like font, Glenn himself as a child narrating his story. We're hearing sort of voices that are speaking to him in you know, the sort of emotion, the voices of his emotions. We're hearing his impression of what people around him are thinking about him. Right, so there's a whole kind of drama unfolding here. And it takes us from birth to the boarding schools. He joins the Marines, uh, eventually goes to college. Right? Oops. Goes to college, then begins to experience alcoholism. And then he, what he titles here, Fate, was a really bad car accident that he had which left him in the hospital long enough that he lost his job, lost his home, and became homeless. And here we get the story of his homelessness. And then we go on, and it becomes more kind of cerebral as we go. So instead of talking only about experience, he started to talk about how he came to be able to forgive other people and to forgive himself, and how he learned about humility, how he learned how to um, accept change, uh, about how to develop ambitions, how to accept when your ambitions don't work out as you might have hoped. And the whole thing concludes with this point here, which is a, a titled Reflection. And I'll read that. It says, I have known success and failure, love and hate, loss and gain, a life of extremes. Dare I ask, what can life do to me now? I do not fear what life may bring, whatever life's intent. It was done a long time ago. Tender years and sadly, tender lives have passed. Throughout most of my life, I never knew who I was, nor did I know the answer to the question, this moment we call life, what does it mean? Not that I know, perhaps destiny has something to say. And then at the bottom we get this little poem. Mission is done, I will miss you, children of the sun. Follow your heart, believe in fate, deep within me no longer any hate. Goodbye, Milky Way. So here he is, again, not only telling his story, but making sense of his story for himself and for us that we can read this tale, that we can read about how the teller of the tale has reflected upon its meaning, or even reflected upon how he's not quite sure what it means. Right? Um, and that the capacity to do that and to have an audience, in this case in the form of a book, with which to share that was enormously meaningful for Glenn. And I'll add as a sort of a sad footnote to this story that about a year after this was published, Glenn passed away. Um, he had been working, he had, uh, talk about somebody who sort of come back from, from some pretty traumatic experiences. Uh, he managed to get housing and he was also working at the St. Francis Center part-time. He was fairly young, he was in his early 50s I think, and one day he didn't show up for work and it turned out that he had, he had passed away. And so in many ways, this story here is his last will and testament. <coughs> Quite literally, I, I tried to get in touch with his son to see, uh, he had a, the, the they discovered that Glenn had a son back in Oklahoma who was going to take possession of his effects. And I got in touch with him to see, can we keep his papers? Right? That when he would come to see us, he would bring in copies of his writing um, and he kept them in the, the apartment uh, where he lived. I asked, can, can we take them and archive them here at the university? I would hate for that to disappear. And interestingly, although I think not, I, I don't blame the son. The son ultimately decided not to do that. And I think it was for two reasons. On the one hand, he doesn't know me from a hole in the wall. He doesn't know the University of Denver from a hole in the wall. And so the thought of just handing over his father's stuff, I think he was probably rightly distrustful. Who knows what they're going to do with it, right? Maybe they're going to go and turn it into a movie and there's money to be made. And you know, I'm not going to, none of that is going to come back to my family. But also I think it was because it was all that he had of his dad. It was really all that he had left of his dad was his writing. And so he took possession of it of it himself. 
So I want to talk at least a little bit um, about another side of the story, which so far what I've been talking about is how it is an individual person accessing um, their literacy can tell their own stories and how telling your own story can make a difference in your life and even in your death. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about folks who make an effort to very publicly tell their stories in an effort to change all right, the world in which they live. Not just to make sense of it or just to kind of come to terms with it, but who are actually trying to change um, the public sphere in which stories get told. And so I've got an image here. This is from an old Time magazine. You're looking at a guy by the name of Lewis Mumford. Lewis Mumford, um, you would probably call him a, an urban sociologist, but I might say that he is like Aristotle, kind of a philosopher of the city. He was fascinated with the idea of the city, of the polis, just as Aristotle was, and devoted his life to kind of meditating upon this thing. Lewis was born in Flushing, New York. Do you have any New Yorkers in the room? There's always at least a couple of New Yorkers in the room. Anybody from Queens? No? Is that a half a hand? Does that mean you're from Long Island? What? OK, that's good enough. So uh, Mumford grew up over here in, in Flushing. This is Flushing Meadows Park in the mid-60s. Mumford was quite a bit older than that. But here's what it looked like kind of at its height when the World Fair was there kind of the world city, a global city as world's, world's fairs tend to be. Here's kind of what it looked like when Mumford was a young man. That part of Queens was really just a swamp. It was kind of a landfill project. And there were huge he heaps of ashes that were uh, brought over from Brooklyn and dumped into this swamp. And so they formed these sort of gigantic mountains. Any of y'all ever read The Great Gatsby? Do you remember? They, they're always driving past the Valley of Ashes. Okay, that's Corona Park, the Corona Dumps, they called it. Okay. That's also where I grew up. <laughs> and that's how I learned about the, reading The Great Gatsby myself. I read a footnote somewhere in the back of the book, and it said the Valley of Ashes, or Corona Queens, back before they filled it in and paved it over and put up houses and stuff. And if you read that book, you may recall it's a very striking image. It's meant to evoke like stories of King Arthur and the wasteland, and it can only be sort of brought back to life by achieving the Holy Grail, you know. I remember reading, I said, wow, I grew up in the actual wasteland. <laughs> Does that mean I'll achieve the Holy Grail? Right? Still hasn't happened, but you know, I, I'm holding out hope. But in any case, that's what, this is what Flushing and Queens look like today. That's where Mumford grew up in a time period that encompassed both of the images that I'm showing you here. And I think that we can see why he might have become really fascinated with this idea of what a city is because he saw one born. On the left there, that's like pure bios, right? That is just pure material life, not even life, it's dead, right? But just sort of purely physical and material. And it turned into something like that, something so overpoweringly symbolic. And Mumford was fascinated with how that can happen. And so in an article that he wrote in the 1930s, he was trying to define what is a city? What makes a city a city? He gives us this definition. The city in its complete sense then is a geographic plexus, an economic organization, an institutional process, a theater of social action, and an aesthetic symbol of collective unity. The city fosters art and is art. The city creates the theater and is the theater. It is the city, the city is theater, that man's more purposive activities are focused and work out through conflicting and cooperating personalities, events, groups into more significant culminations. It's quite a mouthful, but what it means is kind of an interesting idea. Uh, that if we're thinking about what is it distinguishes a city kind of as a way of life from other ways of life, that it's not just the fact, as we all know, that there's sort of more people there, buildings are bigger, there's more business that goes on where you can see plays and go to museums and so on. He's saying that a city is itself a form of art, that living in a city and participating in a city, you are living in a kind of live action, improvised form of theater. Okay. Um, that it is a, a, a sort of spontaneous story that grows out of all the differences of the people who occupy it. And so it's with that in mind that I want to, at least briefly, give you a couple of examples of how it is that stories can be kind of embedded in the world around you. How you can read the urban landscape and see the stories that are being told. And also, see how it is that those stories are sites of conflict. Where, where, as I was saying before, um, that there's power involved in all of this and the ways in which stories are structured and who's allowed to tell them and who not. 
um, we can see that written into the landscape as well. So I was talking with you before about the St. Francis Center. That's a picture of it from the outside. Let's take a look across the street. Very different, no? Right. And this picture was taken, I forget, it's on the, the timestamp is on there, though I can't see it. It's probably about 2008, 2009. Um, right about the time that the, the market crashed. Remember when the housing market kind of crashed and, and uh, the, the, the whole world's economy almost crashed? Well, when that happened, sort of the, the steamroller of gentrification had been rolling from lower downtown and the 16th Street Mall into the Five Points neighborhood, and it stopped right there. Right? It stopped right there. Right? That's when the, market, the bottom fell out of the market and the steamroller stopped. And so, You've got what I think is just a, just a perfect metaphor for that moment in American history. On one side of the street, we've got homeless people. On the other side of the street, because I have, to this day, I don't think I've seen anybody live in one of those condos, we've got peopleless homes. So you think the obvious thing would be to say, okay, well, you, the homeless people can go and occupy the peopleless homes, right? But we know that's not gonna happen. That's not the way that our world works. So here you're seeing where you know, the, the power struggle of gentrification, play it out, play itself out kind of in the landscape. Look a little further down from the St. Francis Center. You see that white and blue building? Okay. This is what it looked like when I first started going there. It was a kind of disused hotel. At some point, it says cop shop on the side. I think the police had set up some kind of community, uh, you know, place where the community could interact. This is it from a different angle. Um, but by this point, it, nobody has occupied this thing in a long time. It was just a terrible, terrible fire trap. And the F St. Francis Center was deathly afraid that this thing was going to go up in flames. It was just destined to happen and that it would take out the whole block. Okay. Let's look at it in, I think this is three, four years later. That looks pretty different too, right? But you know what? You might think, oh, okay, well, that's just more condos like the ones that were across the street. You know, it's just more development, more gentrification. That is, in fact, housing for the homeless. It's permanent, full-time housing for homeless folks. What the St. Francis Center was able to do was they had been trying to get that other building condemned for a good long time, and it, it wasn't happening. And finally, they came up with the bright idea, what if we can get investors to put up something new in its place? Which they did. Part of the condition of doing that, though, part of the way that you are able to gather the interest of the powers that be is to say, will keep it aesthetically consistent <laughs> with the, the kind of new and gentrified neighborhood that is building up. And so what you've got what look like fancy houses, fancy condos and stuff, and which, I mean, they are in some sense, but it's not for the millions of yuppies who are moving to, to Colorado to work in the tech industry and buy pot, okay? <laughs> this is for folks who are poor and who have no place else to go. We go around the corner real quick and then I think we're gonna have to call it. <laughs> okay, so this, those of you who are native Denverites know that Denver is on a grid system that goes north and south, east and west, but the kind of upper left-hand quadrant of it goes off the sort of grid, so it's at a kind of a weird angle to the, the rest of the map. And as a result, you get these sort of little triangular islands where the one part of the map and the other part of the map meet one another. So what we're looking at here, this is called the triangle. That's what it was called amongst the folks at St. Francis. It's just around the corner. And it sits between Catholic Charities on one side of it. The Denver Rescue Mission is just across the street. In other words, these are the two major um, nighttime homeless shelters in Denver. And so this little island here became a place where folks could congregate, both to um, you know, sort of wait for the, the shelters to open, but also because it was a place that was kind of generally understood to be where the, the homeless met, where you could meet your friends who were in a similar condition. Um, this was a kind of an area that was, by accident, you might say, set aside for you. And so you know, if you came by during the winter at the right time of day, you might see 200 people packed onto this little triangle. But almost no matter when you would go by, you would see, as you can kind of see here, little groups of people interacting with one another. And it's really important, again, that, as I said before, there is no job harder than being homeless or being poor. And so if you need somebody to watch your cart while you go across the street to get your blood pressure checked, or uh, to keep an eye on your kid while you go to see if there are gonna be any rooms available for the night, right? 
that you kind of, you really need a community when you're in that situation. Here's what it looks like now. What does that look like to you? Yeah, right? It's a community garden, is what they call it. And it seems like a lovely thing in the abstract, right? Who could be against the community garden? Vegetables and other kinds of plant life and so on, right? And the community coming together. But you notice there's a fence around it? And it's a locked fence. You need to have a code and a card to get in there. Okay? And that is so that the folks who have an address in the neighborhood, in the fancy condos around the corner, for example, well, they can get access to the community garden. Meanwhile, the folks who used to congregate there are completely displaced. Right? And so if you walk around that neighborhood, the 200 or more people that you used to see packing that sidewalk, or packing that little island um, of an afternoon, no longer have that space. They're kind of scattered to the four winds. They're all over the place, which again is a hugely disruptive thing in your life because this is where you could come to meet the people that you knew and to get the kinds of uh, aid that one gets from one's friends when you're in a kind of a difficult situation. Um, that's just gone. Instead, we've got, I don't know, organic honey or something that, that people can eat. Um, I'm going to cut things just a, a little bit short now um, and see if I can make a, a quick transition into where I really wanted to sort of end up with all of this. It's not only to tell you the story of my experience working in the Community Writing Center and stories related to that, <coughs> but to try to say just a little bit about what this might mean to you particularly at this stage in your life when you're starting a new chapter in your life story here at the University of Denver. So you've probably heard or you've probably read as you were investigating where you're going to go to school, or maybe today, uh, this week during Discoveries Week, you've probably heard it said that the mission of the University of Denver is to be a great private university dedicated to the public good. If you haven't heard that already, you know that well. And that sounds like a, a noble goal, right? kind of a lofty goal to be dedicated to the public good. And if you look at the, the material on the website, for example, go to the chancellor's page, look at the, the vision statement that they've put together for the next 10 years, you'll see that a good deal of the activity and a good deal of the excitement that's taking place on campus now and into the foreseeable future has to do with what they call public good work, it has to do with connecting what we do on campus to the city off of campus, to the state of Colorado, to, to the country, to the world. Um, but that has been named a kind of a real focus here. And I think that's very much all to the good. But I also think that in order for that to work, in order for the university to really engage with the public, as at least myself and my colleagues have tried to do here, and as many, many other members of uh, faculty across campus do, in order to really dedicate this university to the public good, it is absolutely crucial that you join us, that students be on board, that you commit your education to the public good. All right. Where we are right now, you, you could not find a more sort of concentrated example of what I was quoting Aristotle before uh, and talking about Zoe, right? the life of the mind, the life of the world of symbols and so on. That's what a university really is, it's all about knowledge and communication um, and the diversity of stories and so on and so forth. <laughs> um, in order to kind of knock down the walls and separate the university from the world outside traditionally, it is absolutely vital that you all hold the rest of us accountable to that, hold the faculty accountable, hold the staff and the administration accountable, but also hold yourself accountable to that. That what we need to do in order to make good on that promise, is in some ways, in as many ways as we can, to enlarge the public sphere that we occupy so that we can, in fact, hear the stories of some of the folks that I was talking about now, that we can hear from voices that are traditionally marginalized. Okay. And if you decide, I want my education to be not just about myself and my career prospects and so on and so forth, which is all fine and well, but that it's also got to be about teaching myself how to hear, how to really hear okay, stories of folks who are very different from me and stories that are typically marginalized, and to learning about ways to amplify those stories so that voices that typically aren't heard aren't marginalized 
at least not as much anymore, but finally get to come to center stage. If you insist that that's what the university community does, then I think we actually stand a chance of making good on the commitment to the public good that we really aspire to. I want to thank you all for coming here and listening to my story today. And I look forward to seeing at least some portion of you in class in the coming weeks and months. Thanks very much.